Rosemary. Wat mij betreft, uh, ik hoop dat we elkaar weer terugzien op uh, 9 september aanstaande. Dag. My name is Ian Runacres and I'm the founder member of a Manchester indie band called Dislocation Dance. I came to Manchester from Wolverhampton in 1978 um, and by the Christmas I'd actually met other members of the sort of formative version of the, of the band. But I think by Christmas 1978 the kind of band was, was, was formed really. Show me this location dance. The band was really formed by um, the original bass player, Paul Emerson. At the time, back in Manchester, there was a, a small Virgin record shop um, just off Newton Street. But the most important thing was a notice board with people advertising for band members. In the middle of the notice board, there was a, there was a, a typed um, sort of A4 sheet and it said, musicians required for a band influences as follows. And then there was a list of about 100 bands. Just all sorts of stuff, just the most incredibly varied thing. I just thought, whoever's into all of this is worth meeting. So I phoned him up and he said, I've already got a band together. I've got all the musicians I want. I've got a guitarist. And I sort of blagged my way to sort of come to his first rehearsal. Um, Catherine Way, our original vocalist, was there. And so I said, well, I'll, I'll, be, I'll join. I'll be part, you know, let me be part of the band. concert was um, at the Factory Club um, in Hume, which is now long gone, sadly. Well, ver very early on, we engaged the services of a friend of Paul, the bass player, um, called Pete Wright, um, who saw himself as a band manager. That's what he wanted to be. Um, we became quite friendly with Richard Boone, the Buscox manager. We used to hang out at the Buscox offices a lot, the New Hormones offices. And Richard was instrumental in helping us to put our first single out. Particularly, Richard Boone was quite good friends with Tony Wilson. Um, and Tony was always um, looking for bands to play at the Factory Club. He offered us a gig before we'd even really got much of a set together. The Factory Club was, was, had a weird layout. It had a, a sort of balcony and an upstairs room. Um, but upstairs in this room on the balcony were Tony and people from Factory. So Alan and Rasmus um, and, and Tony were, were at most of the gigs. And they invited us up afterwards um, and basically said, do you want to be on Factory? You know, would you like to be on Factory Records? Um, but we'd we'd already committed ourselves to and be, and become friends with Richard Boone and saw ourselves on New Hormones, you know, and, and you know had a already had a loyalty to um, to that label. So you know, if we were if we were looked at it from a business from a commercial sense, we should have gone to Factory, 
And that's one of the decisions, I think, that we made right then at the very beginning that could have changed the course for us. <laughs> April 1982 um, we did a tour of the east coast of America with the band. We landed in New York and we went to the apartment of the, of the promoter. Uh, she had a flat in Greenwich Village and the plan was we'd just got our guitars and basic bits of kit and we were hiring a van and we were hiring our back line so the drum kits and all the amps were coming from this higher company and um, I think the check bounced or it wasn't honoured or something happened and basically we couldn't hire the gear and we were sitting in the flat thinking the tour's over and by chance uh, Tony Wilson arrived at the flat to see the promoter and I think the fact that Richard was there it was just a sort of let's meet up we're in New York so Tony arrived and Tony said, I'll pay. I'll pay for your back line, your van and everything, and then you pay me when you get back. It was, he didn't need to do that. He just could have left. It was a really lovely act of generosity. Um, and sadly, years later, um, this must have been not long before he died, I saw Tony in town just off King Street and he was heading, he was actually going into a coffee bar and you know when you, you kind of see somebody and they're just there and I just thought it was one of those moments where I thought I'd like to tell him that story I'd like to tell him how grateful I was for that event because he saved the tour um, and I sort of thought but will he will he remember who I am will he even remember who I am and will he remember it or Will he have a different take on the story or... And it was gone, he'd gone. He'd walked into the, and it was too late. I just thought I'd just missed it. And I really regret not going up to him saying, you did this for me once and I'll be, I'm forever grateful. Don't knock me down. I know I don't. I actually wasn't into punk that much because I didn't like the lack of musicality but I liked the experimentation and I liked the fact that people were being much more daring so I was really into bands like Talking Heads, uh, Pear Ubu and so I was very much into, into improvisation and experimentation and songs that weren't structured like songs partly into that and I think that came out in the music it was quite experimental and then as time went by, I was influenced by different, different artists. So it was sort of being very eclectic really and sort of magpie-ish and plucking at different influences. And, and I think that's reflected in, if you listen to the songs I've written over time, I've got better at writing songs and I think I've got, I've got better as a musician, but I'm, I just write the things that I would like to listen to. From the early 80s, 81, 82, we did a lot of gigs. 83, Catherine was in the band and we toured Europe and did a bit of TV. And I got a sense that things were climbing up and then they peaked and started to diminish. And I think it was partly we'd signed to Rough Trade at the same time as the Smiths. And I had a sense that Rough Trade had got a number of artists and they were looking at them. In fact, Jeff Travis said it to me once. He said, Morrissey is a star. He just has star quality. And I just thought, and you're telling me this because I'm not. 
And I don't think we helped by the fact that I kept on writing different songs that weren't like each other. So we'd say, this is the next single, and they'd say, but it's absolutely nothing like the last single. It doesn't even sound like the same band. You know, so from a marketing perspective, we were probably really hard work. So I think the band didn't end. It just sort of kind of began to fragment. Catherine did a de went off to do a degree and we recruited a different singer called Sonia, who's a fantastic singer. Um, in fact, that's a whole other story. Uh, bass player Paul wanted to go and live in Portugal. Andy was working a lot with Power Fountains, who were, you know, taking a lot of his time. And I had a friend at the time called Jerry who wanted to set up a label. And I was currently, at that time, this was about 86, 87, um, I was going round the major labels trying to get Sonia a deal as a solo artist and writing songs with her. So I was kind of trying to pursue that and then this friend Jerry said let's set up a label together and the band had pretty much dissolved and I thought well that might be a good vehicle for, for Sonia, you know we'll release her stuff as well as other stuff. And basically the premise of the label was um, a world music label. So the, the premise of the, the, the idea of the label was sort of Manchester Motown, um, Mute Records were going to do the publishing and Joe Bloggs would be the label. Uh, but it was just too much. I was just getting really ill. So I remember, I think it one weekend I drove to to um, to Bristol to see Womad, who was struggling at the time because they owed us money for manufacturing. And we drove to London, had a meeting with Mute to try and get an advance out of them for publishing for this soul label and they were struggling because Depeche Mode were just losing loads of money. I think only Betty Boo was making money for them at the time. And then I drove back to Manchester and had a meeting with Joe Bloggs and by then it was quite late at night and came out of Joe Bloggs and I was sick in the car park and I just thought I think this is too much. This is just killing me. So um, in the end, I said to my business partner, Jerry, I think we need to end this. Mm. And I said, let's, get, let's um, engage an insolvency practitioner. Let's do it properly. Let's declare ourselves insolvent. So a friend of mine at the time said, uh, there's some jobs going at the council. Just go and get yourself a job there. So I applied for a couple of jobs and bizarrely got them both. So I just picked the one that paid the most, which happened to be in housing. And then um, went to my first day at work, went to the town hall and was told that um, I was going to be placed in a little project office out in, in Burnage. So got picked up and ferried down to this project office, walked into the office and someone said, here's your new boss. And it was Phil. So we worked together for a few years and both being massive music fans, you know, talked music a lot. And I knew that he'd written, he wrote songs. And for, I think for the first couple of years, I just thought I've had it with music. I don't want to do any more. I, I gave away amps and guitars, which was just criminal, really. Why did, you know, to do that? But I just wanted to have nothing more to do with it. I, it just, I just thought this has nearly killed me. Can't stand it. And it was Phil really that said, you know, why don't we just, why don't we just do a bit of recording? I've got a little eight track recorder. Why don't we just do some songs? And we started to write songs and very quickly wrote a lot and, and recorded a lot of songs. And, you know, put all my old band stuff behind me and wanted to do something different. So we released a couple of albums under the name Brightside that was very guitar-y. So not like Dislocation Dance at all, really. It was quite quite rocky in some ways, indie, um, got to play a bit of slide guitar, which is, got to play a bit of distorted guitar, which wasn't really me, and it was, you know, it was nice to do that. Um, we did that, and then a second album, and by then I'd been working at the council in housing for probably five years, um, coming up towards the late 90s, and um, I got news of a 
Japanese pop star who'd released the single and I think it was called Mickey's Diary, Michael's Diary, something like that. And it was really like one of my singles. And um, this Japanese woman had said that she was really influenced by dislocation dance. So there was a bit of a sort of indie interest out there, a little sort of minority cult thing going on. And um, this small Japanese label called Vinyl Japan said we'd like to re-release all your old stuff because there's a bit of market and the interest. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if they invited us out to play? And then they did. They said, come and play J Japan. And of course, the original lineup had long since dissipated, but I got most people back together. Uh, the original bass player, Paul, had been living in Portugal for years and hadn't played a note for years and said he wasn't really interested. So I said to Phil, be our bass player. Um, we went, yeah, it was it was summer 2000, we went to Japan and did this little tour, so a few nights in Tokyo, and then we got the bullet train down to Osaka, or Osaka, or I think Osaka was how they said it there, curiously, um, which was just a great city, fantastic, really funky, just brilliant, and played some gigs there, and uh, it's just a dream. And that prompted Phil and I to then sort of carry on with the name Dislocation Dance and do some more recordings with some of the old band members. So we recorded a few songs as a sort of follow on project and then did the Chroma album. <laughs> point to recruiting new members for the band and it came about because I was offered a gig at the Jazz Cafe in Camden um, and it was partly as a follow-up to LTM who are our current label. So LTM picked up where Van Japan left off and re-released all my old back catalogue and and some of the more recent stuff as well, which was great, really good. And as a consequence of that, and some of the reviews that we'd had, um, a promo big a promoter in London called Adrian Gibson, who puts on a lot of sort of Latin and jazzy stuff, um, said, "Come and play." And I knew that there were, you know, there were some serious issues with getting the old band back together, because. Andy was on tour with James pretty exclusively. So he was doing a lot with James. And when he wasn't doing stuff with James, he was doing stuff with a band called The Spaceheads, who was him and my old drummer, Richard. So they toured as a drum and trumpet dance thing, who are fantastic. Um, so, you know, I just thought, I'm pretty low down the priorities here in terms of what they can commit to. Um, and so that was kind of the core, really. I just thought, well, I want to play the old songs. I need to get musicians together that can play play those songs. Um, my wife actually played in a swing band, still does play in a, in a local swing band. And at the time, there was a trumpet player in the band who was also my neighbour. He lived across the road from where he used to live. so. I knew him and um, I said to him, do you fancy playing trumpet? And, you know, and said, yeah. And he also played in a jazz band and Chris was the drummer in his jazz band. So I was just basically sort of picking people who I knew really, um, partly because I liked them. You know, this wasn't, this wasn't, the priority I think for me was to get on with people and to enjoy playing with them, you know, because I'd come across people who were incredible musicians, but were unreliable or, you know, borderline mental health issues or, you know what I mean? Just, just, 
I don't need trouble. What I want is enjoyment and people who I can enjoy playing with. So Chris and John were from my wife's, Steph's swing band. Um, and Andrew also was through my wife because they worked together in their child and adolescent mental health team in Macclesfield. So I'd known Andrew for a long time and knew that he played piano and said, come and play. So, you know, it's as simple as that, really. It's just gathering people together who are like and, you know, who I was happy to spend time with and who I could trust and, you know, enjoy their company and enjoy playing with them. There was um, a really lovely film, one of Woody Allen's films from the early 80s that wasn't a particular hit at the time and I don't think a lot of people remembered it, called Zelig. And um, he played the part of a character that just happened to end up in really famous scenes. So I think it was set in the 1930s, so he ended up at the Nuremberg Rally and he was just sort of, you know, there but no one noticed and it was the first use I think of that sort of you know a modern character modern bit of filming being placed in an old bit of footage and I kind of look back and think at some of the things that happened to me um, were quite like that that I was there when things were happening but just on the periphery you know sitting at home and Tony Wilson walks into my living room was great and in New York we played with support to Toots and the Maitles at the New York Ritz and the Rolling Stones walked through our dressing room and just thought this is surreal this is you know they're there but they don't they're not interested in me they're just interested in their mates but I guess if I was a different person I might have jumped up and you know I could have jumped up and made something of it and you know try to ingratiate myself with people but you know, it just wasn't, wasn't me. I suppose the question is, am I bitter and twisted about not being famous? And and I'd have to, I'd want to try and answer that honestly. And I think that to some degree I am. So, so yeah, I think obviously I would have liked to have had greater success. I don't regret at all the things that I did do, you know, because I did, I gave up a job to playing bands and, you know, I worked hard to try and make something of it and tried being a label, would like to have still been a label. Um, so yeah, I suppose it would, it would have been a parallel universe, a parallel life, it would have been interesting. But um, just be careful of what you wish for, because I've seen people go on to have success and not be that happy, really and not really know where their lives are going and you know it's and and to have to sustain it so I don't have to worry about any of that and and I have given up music lots of times and then just gravitated back and I think that just says it all really is that I just love it love it so much love the love making music and writing music and creating music and playing and performing and being in a band and you know being an engineer and being a songwriter and nurturing other talents and I just love it it's it is really rewarding in a way that you know I can't imagine other things being being creative
I've always enjoyed the creative process and I've always enjoyed writing new songs and what's really exciting at the moment is writing songs for Sam. I've got lots of songs that are sort of we've tried and we've left behind and I'm sort of rediscovering some of those and changing the key and saying to Sam you know this could work for you which is really nice and and sort of experimenting with different textures so actually taking it all down a notch and and dismantling the sound a bit and making it more organic and natural and acoustic is really nice. We've got piles of songs, sort of some almost complete, some sort of working up and so we've set ourselves an aim of actually having a, some batches of songs that we'll put out there. So we definitely will play live again. Um, once we've got this batch of songs recorded and you know I think we've got product to, to promote um, and maybe even before then because it's just a lovely thing to do we will definitely be playing and I think and I'd like to play as the big band because um, it's really lovely to have you know Andrew on keyboards filling out the sound and John's trumpet and just a lot going on is lovely and lots of voices and instrument swaps and so I love doing that. the ideal um, to be honest would be to have to have have you know made enough money to just be able to do it more really so having to do a full-time job and then find time for creating music is a pain and you know that's but you know I actually really enjoy my job too and I enjoy the people I work with and I wouldn't have any of that so yeah, you can't you can't wish for something else. I think the thing is is just to is to really love what you've got and I do. I do.